It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker, and uh, welcome back. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, over the past five months since the Legislature has been out, things have only gotten worse for working people in this province. They're telling me they feel like their needs are being ignored while this government is so bogged down in schemes and scandals like the Greenbelt scheme. We know at least eight people in the Premier's inner circle have been interviewed by the RCMP. Can the Premier tell us who those individuals are and how many still work in his office? And to reply, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's an honour to rise on this side of the House, and I appreciate the question from the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, as we have said time and time and time again, our government has been and will be cooperating fully with the RCMP. Any questions about that investigation should be directed towards them. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, and I can understand why the Premier doesn't want to answer these questions, but it is my job to ask because the people of this province want answers. Now, we knew the Greenbelt scheme went as far as Las Vegas, but according to new reporting from the Toronto Star, this scandal might go even further. So, Speaker, can the Premier tell us why the RCMP would be looking at banking records in Europe as part of their investigation into this government? Criminal Affairs, a member for Brantford Brant. No, thank you. Um, the Speaker, and again, through you, this is an ongoing investigation with the RCMP, and any questions about that investigation should be directed to the RCMP, and I would urge uh, the Leader of the Opposition to do so if she has inquiries for them. Thank you. The final supplementary back to the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, thank you. The silence tells us a lot, right? The, the schemes and scandals of this government are costing everybody in the province. Ontarians deserve the truth. these questions because people want us to scrap those schemes. They want us to build homes, hire doctors, fix schools, and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. So I'm going to ask again to the Premier of this province to have the guts to stand up and answer a question about this. Will the Premier tell us who in Europe stood to gain from his Greenbelt scheme? Personal attacks don't uh, add to the debate. Member for Brantford Brant to reply. No, thank you, Speaker. And again, I will reiterate our government is uh, cooperating fully with the RCMP investigation. Any questions related to that investigation should be directed towards the RCMP. I will, so as the uh, opposition leader did bring that up, we are building Ontario in this province. We are building the highways that the people of Ontario need. We are building the hospitals that the people of Ontario need. We have brought 800,000 jobs back to the province of Ontario. After that, member and her government saw 300,000 jobs leave this province. We are getting it done for the province of Ontario. We are building the province of Ontario, and we will remain laser-focused on the concerns of the people of Ontario, housing and affordability. We will get it done. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Add actually that manufacturing jobs in the province of Ontario are down under this government. But listen, no matter, no matter where I go, look at the facts. Stop the clock. Okay. Order. Stop the clock. We're not even five minutes into it. And I have to be able to hear the member who has the floor. Okay. Restart the clock. You to the opposition. Thank you, Speaker. The truth is that no matter where I go in this province, people are feeling stuck, right? They're stuck looking for an affordable place to live. They're stuck trying to find a doctor. They're stuck paying the bill for this Premier's schemes and scandals. Let's talk about another one of those schemes. 
the luxury spa that's being built at Ontario Place. In the past few weeks, we've learned the cost of subsidizing this project is going to cost the people of this province hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars. Speaker, with everything people are facing in the province of Ontario right now, I have to ask, which struggling Ontario family told this Premier the answer to their problems was a luxury spa in downtown Toronto? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The NDP have filed a complaint with the Integrity Commissioner. The Integrity Commissioner is reviewing that complaint at the moment and has specifically asked me not to comment on that matter. However, like the member on this side of the House said, we will remain laser focused on rebuilding Ontario Place to make it a place that people can enjoy once again. We will uh, be laser focused on building more housing for the people of Ontario Response. and making sure that we reduce traffic and congestion in the province of Ontario. Supplementary question. Speaker, I, I, you know, people can't even afford to put food on the table in this province, and this government is shoveling money into a European spa corporation. Worse, evidence is now suggesting that the bid process for this project may have been compromised from the start. Instead of finding ways to help people, this government was focused on avoiding accountability passing legislation to give themselves extraordinary new powers and exempting the project from standards of accountability. And I will go back to the Premier. If the, if the Minister of Infrastructure has been told by the Integrity Commissioner she can't answer the question while she is being investigated, maybe the Premier can answer this question. Did Therma get preferential treatment in their bid to turn Ontario Place into a luxury spa? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much. Again, the NDP has filed a complaint with the Integrity Commissioner. The Integrity Commissioner is looking into the complaint. The Integrity Commissioner has asked that I do not comment on that matter. What I find very surprising is that the Leader of the Opposition walks into this House seeking assistance from the Integrity Commissioner and now is asking me to disrespect him by responding. I will not do Order. that. I respect the Office Order. of the Integrity Commissioner. And I respect the Integrity Commissioner, and I will take his advice and guidance. Order. The opposition will come to order. The final entry. I mean, this is what happens, I guess, when you have a government under criminal RCMP yeah. investigation and with the Integrity Commissioner buried in complaints. They won't even answer a question. They hide behind it. Speaker, this government has lost the plot completely too focused on their own schemes and scandals to manage the basics that people expect of their government. How else could you explain the extraordinary lengths they apparently went to in order to make sure that Therma got access to this public land? Emails that we've uncovered show that Therma was communicating with the government about their bid despite an NDA and that the Premier's now chief of staff was well aware. So to the Premier again, because he certainly could answer this question, did the government change the rules to question. give this company an advantage in this scheme and why? <laughs> Minister of Infrastructure. While the leader of the official opposition continues to disrespect the office of the integrity commissioner, I will not. But, Mr. Speaker, I will tell you what I was busy doing this summer. I was busy traveling the province to announce 54 projects in the province of Ontario that will help build 511,000 homes. From Gananoque, 416 homes. London, 23 million for 17,000 homes. And Brampton, with my colleagues in Brampton, 30 million for 12,000 homes. In Prince Edward County, welcoming our, our very new colleague, 18 million for 4,000 homes. Mr. Speaker, our focus is building more homes and reducing traffic and congestion in the province of Ontario. Okay, the next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, uh, speaker home care patients, their families, and health care workers who support them are in a state of panic. Doctors have described the situation as utter chaos after this province, this government, suddenly switched suppliers with almost no notice. 
The Ontario Medical Association has shared terrifying impacts of this shortage. Home care patients being sent to emergency rooms because their supplies have run out. Patients in palliative care unable to get sedatives. And people facing life-threatening infections without proper sanitary supplies. My question again to the Premier, Speaker, how much longer will vulnerable patients have to wait for medical supplies? And what is this Premier doing to fix it today? The Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The issue that the member opposite raises is absolutely unacceptable. We have been working with Ontario Health at Home to ensure that no patients, no patients' families, no clinicians are impacted by a logistics issue. I want to assure the people of Ontario that we have been on this issue since we first learned that there were shortages being delivered. But I also want to remind people that we know this is unacceptable and we are not going to allow this to continue. I am on it. My ministry is on it. As recently as last night, we had another update reinforcing that this cannot continue in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. I'd say it is not only unacceptable, it is unethical actually, and this sudden change of suppliers came with absolutely no notice in late September. What was this government playing at? It is now one month later, and patients and care providers are scrambling to get essential medical supplies. If they get any, they're getting substandard supplies, like gauze that's not going to re reach the standards. This is risking patient safety. Speaker, is this utter disaster in home care because the Premier tried to cut corners yet again? Or is this another scheme to benefit more government insiders at Bayshore? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Health. And at once, I will say it again, it is absolutely unacceptable, which is why I have directed the Ontario Health at Home to ensure that any patient, any patient family, any clinician who has gone and secured medical uh, necessary equipment will get reimbursed. It's unacceptable, full stop. We're making sure that going forward, this cannot happen again, and we want to assure the people of Ontario that we have been on it since we started hearing that there were concerns about deliveries. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. The federal Liberal carbon tax, Speaker. Speaker, the members of the opposition and the independent Liberals groan because they have realized. And ask the opposition to come to order. <laughs> At high volume, I still need to hear him and can't. Okay, the member for Perth Wellington. Speaker, the members of the opposition, the independent Liberals, groan and heckle me right now because they realize they've already lost the next provincial election, Speaker, because they support the federal Liberal carbon tax. And while members of the opposition parties want more taxes, Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has cut taxes. And, Speaker, this has led to billions of dollars flowing into Ontario and over 800,000 new jobs created since we took government in 2018. And Speaker, you may be wondering how we achieved this success. Well, we cut the Liberal taxes they raised, and we cut the red tape the Liberals put up. So can the Minister Question. of Economic Development and Trade update this place on what we are doing to attract more investment and create more good-paying jobs? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Well, wow. <laughs> Welcome back. He's had, your, he's had his coffee this morning. Speaker, 43,200 new jobs were created in Ontario just last month alone. Speaker, all were full-time and all were in private companies. Speaker, our manufacturing sector now employs more than 800 thousand workers, one of the highest levels that we've seen in 15 years.
That's what happens when you lower taxes, reduce red tape, and create the conditions for businesses to succeed. We are seeing companies right across the province invest, expand, and create good paying jobs. Speaker, Ontario is an economic powerhouse. You've heard the, the Premier say this over Response. and over. We are an economic powerhouse. We are the envy of the world and will continue to let everyone know that we are open for business. Yeah, yeah. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for his response. I'm glad to hear our government will continue to keep taxes low. Unfortunately, carbon tax Crombie is promising more taxes for Ontarians and small businesses. This summer, she went on the On Poly podcast and Speaker advocated for a completely new tax, Speaker, what? during an affordability crisis. Really? The retail sales tax, Speaker. Speaker, I am just speechless. The Liberal leader is front to raise taxes, Speaker. While the Liberals Order. promise more taxes, our progressive government, conservative government, will continue to listen to businesses and workers and ensure the conditions are there so they can continue to succeed. Can the minister please explain how our record of job creation is compared to the previous Liberal government? Economic. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade can reply. Speaker, there is no comparison with the Liberal record. Today, there are now more than 860,000 more men and women working today than since the day we were elected. In our tech sector, employment has increased by over 100,000 workers. Ontario has added 30,000 AI workers in the last two years. In our auto sector, we've landed $45 billion in new investments, saving 100,000 jobs in the auto sector and adding tens of thousands of new jobs across the supply chain. In our life sciences sector, we've landed game-changing investments of over $5 billion. This has happened, Speaker, when you remove Response. over 500 pieces of strangling red tape, you streamline regulation, and you create the condition for business to succeed. We're leading the way, and the world is taking Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. The Wilmot Land Assembly is this government's next Greenbelt scandal. Wilmot has become ground zero for farmers across this province. Paving over Class 1 farmland for a mega industrial site makes no sense. This Premier has criticized the region of Waterloo, but we now know that it was this government that set the terms for sale, forced the non-disclosure agreements, and are fully funding the purchase and or expropriation of farmland. The new provincial planning statement just came into effect yesterday. The Wilmot Land Assembly is in direct contravention of your own policy. To the Premier, will you stop funding and driving this industrial site on Class 1 farmland, which overrides local democracies and fails rural communities in Ontario? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let's be clear. It is the sole responsibility of the region to assemble land and to work with all affected communities and stakeholders, including the Wilmot farmers. The Premier has made it very clear. Our expectation is that the region treat farmers fairly and respectfully in assembling the land, period. It is no different than any other major investment or assembly project like we did in Volkswagen that I might add the members opposite approved and supported, a project twice the size with no expropriation that will create 3,000 direct jobs and over 30,000 indirect jobs throughout this great province. Over the long term, we believe in a delicate but important balance between a thriving farm and agri-food sector while supporting growth, new investments and good paying jobs. Also in the agri-food processing sector. Here, here. The supplementary question, back to the member for Waterloo. Premier set the terms. Uh, you're funding the displacement of farmers. 
they are ultimately responsible. Look in the mirror. Speaker, agriculture generates $47 billion in economic activity in the province of Ontario. Find, finding the balance between economic development and the agricultural sector is possible, but not at the expense of Class 1 farmland, and not by kicking farmers off their land. We don't even have cost estimates thus far for this entire deal. This will be another costly mistake and scandal on behalf of this government. There hasn't been one public meeting, not one public meeting. Farmers in Ontario should not be treated this way. Premier, will you do the right thing? Will you release the region from the NDA, and will you stop funding this mega-industrial project which displaces and disrespects farmers? Members will please take their seats. After five, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, the region of Waterloo understands that not having shovel-ready sites assembly has already cost them job-creating investments. Now, in their own report, which I'm going to quote from, over the last three years, $10 billion of potential investment and over 14,000 jobs from businesses considering Waterloo Region were lost as different communities were chosen to invest in. So while Ontario did win those investments, companies like Dr. Utger, who planned to invest $200 million and who now employ over 430 people, went elsewhere because the region of Waterloo did not have any land ready. Now, we're doing our part here, Speaker, to help these massive job-creating investments come to Ontario. And the region of Waterloo wants to be a destination that companies choose to come to. But unfortunately, the Liberals and the NDP are content. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the new Minister of Energy and Electrification. Mr. Speaker, winter is coming, and that means higher costs to my constituents in Essex County as a result of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. Families in Essex County and across Ontario are already paying higher prices for groceries and gas and goods and housing. And now because of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax, they're gonna pay an extra $400 per year just to heat their homes. We believe that Ontario families should not be punished, Mr. Speaker, just for heating their homes in the winter time. Can the minister please outline what measures our government is taking to make life more affordable for people in Essex County and across Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. In reply, the Minister of Energy and Electrification. Thank you, Speaker. It's an honour to stand as Ontario's new Minister of Energy and Electrification for the province. And, Mr. Speaker, let us affirm that our priority is affordable energy for the people of Ontario. Because, Speaker, gone are the days where families were paying. 300% more for energy under the former Liberals. Gone are the days where seniors were paying $1,000 more per year because of an ideological government that did not put affordability as their number one priority. Gone are the days of choosing energy contracts 10 times above the market, leading to the highest rates on the continent. Mr. Speaker, our government and our Premier has a plan to generate, to build, to conserve, to store, and to export more clean, affordable energy to our province and the world. We are focused on making life affordable for the people of Ontario, and we will not rest until the federal Liberal carbon tax Fonts. is totally eliminated from our energy rates, from our bills, from our groceries to the people of Ontario. Supplementary, back to the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for that response. I know my constituents in Essex are going to be happy to know that this government is prioritizing affordability when it comes to helping all families. And we need this because the Trudeau Crombie Liberals are imposing a carbon tax, which is nearly 28% of the heating bill when you look at the bill that you receive at your house. Middle class families are already being hit hard. How can the Trudeau Crombie Liberals justify increasing tax on heating fuel and other necessities of life, especially when the cost of living is getting so high? But let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, this government stands by Ontario families, and we will continue advocating to scrap the tax, that Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister, how will our government stand up for people in Ontario and for people in my riding, the riding of Essex, and that we never go Question. back to the short-sighted energy disaster imposed by the previous Liberal government? Minister of Energy and Electrification. Thank you to the member for Essex for the question and his leadership. Uh, Mr. Speaker, while Ontario has one of the cleanest energy grids in the world, we are proud of that record. But what we also recognize, Speaker, is that in order to build our energy system, we need to focus on affordability. Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer in Canada has confirmed that more Ontarians are paying more than they get back under this Liberal scheme. Mr. Speaker, they want to import this punitive tax to the people of Ontario, bringing the worst policies and ideological convictions of the federal Liberals to the people of Ontario, and we say no, because, Mr. Speaker, families are paying $700 more today than they were under the previous plan. Our focus is to use technology, not <coughs> taxation, to drive the reduction in, in emissions. We believe we can reduce emissions while growing our economy. That is what this government has done, because, Mr. Speaker, we are on track to Response. reduce our emissions, hitting our Paris Accord targets without imposing a carbon tax on the people of Ontario. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Eglinton LRT cross, cross down project is billions over budgets, years, years late, and frankly riddled with construction problems. Our St. Paul's residents and small business owners have demanded transparent and accurate answers from Metrolinx and this government on when the construction will end and when the line will open. The only person who seems to be benefiting from this mess is Metrolink CEO Phil Burster, whose salary has risen from half a million dollars in 2018 to more than 800,000 in 2022, wow. and we've heard he's going to go to even above a million annually. That's right. He's going to receive raises from this government, even though he has failed to understand the assignment. Once again, the government's buddies rake in millions of public dollar speakers, while the while the taxpayer is left with nothing. Will the Premier stop doubling down on failure and fire Mr. Phil Burster, the CEO of Metrolinx? Yes. Thank you, yes. Speaker. Yes. Reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are undertaking one of the largest expansions of public transit in the history of not only Canada, but North America. $70 billion over the next 10 years. Mr. Speaker, that member knows that we're in the testing and commissioning phase of that project, and we will continue to do so. We have completed construction on that and will continue to test it to make sure it's a reliable and safe system. Mr. Speaker, this government has delivered like no other for public transit. Let's talk about the benefits to everyday commuters. One fair, Mr. Speaker, putting $1,600 in back in the pockets of those who use public transit every single day. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? The members of the NDP and Liberals voted against that measure as we brought it forward. In fact, they have voted against every single Order. one of our public transit projects that we have put forward in this city. Response. We've seen record gridlock across the province. Our government has a plan, and we're getting it done. Back to the member for Toronto St. Paul, supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. Uh, two years ago, we, the NDP, demanded a, pub a public inquiry into this Eglinton Cross down debacle. Since then, we've learned that under Metrolinx, the Finch West LRT, the Here Ontario LRT projects are also indefinitely in limbo with no open date in sight. And most recently, we learned that Metrolinx cut ties with its chief operating officer, its chief transit planner, and the entire department is in disarray. I mean, how do you plan transit without a chief planner? What is going on at Metrolinx, we're all asking. And let's not forget, it was this government that actually told Metrolinx to keep the opening date a secret from the public. So the schemes and the scandals of this government, they're not getting my community in St. Paul's or any Ontarian anywhere. Question. My question is back to the Premier. Premier, will you agree to a public inquiry into Metrolinx or will you continue to double down on your record of failure? Good morning, Premier. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Speaker, here are the facts. The NDP and Liberals have done Order. and voted against every single one of our projects. For 15 years, the Liberals did absolutely nothing in building this province. We see record gridlock because of their inaction. 
And Mr. Speaker, the NDP are no different. They want nothing built. The Ontario line, which they voted against and questioned every step of the way, opposition will take over come to order. 8,000 cars off the road and will move 400,000 people every single day. It's a shame that the NDP and Liberals don't want to support those projects, Mr. Speaker. But that's not order. new. Every project that this government has put forward, the 413, the Bradford Bypass, Finch, uh, the Eglinton West Extension, Mr. Speaker, the Scarborough Subway Extension. They have doubted those projects every step of the way. Our government is about building. We have a vision for this entire Response. province. We're leading North America in our expansion of public transit, and we will not do the same mistakes of the previous Liberal government. Which the next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. You know what's better than the taste of beer? The taste of beer when you have a family doctor. You know what's better than beating traffic? Beating traffic on the way to your family doctor. And you know what's better than getting money in the mail? Getting money in the mail that you don't have to spend on an expensive substitute for a family doctor. Now, last week, the Ontario Medical Association said that our health care system is in a state of catastrophe. So where has this government been for the last five months, no doubt, on an extended vacation? Health ranks highest on everyone's hierarchy of needs, but it consistently ranks lowest on the Premier's list of priorities. Lack of health care is threatening the future of our province. How can teachers teach, builders build, or drivers drive if they don't have health care? Mr. Speaker. Does the Premier really think that the last-minute appointment of a former Liberal Health Minister justifies his five-month vacation while two and a half million Ontarians don't have a family doctor? Order. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, you know what's better than 15 years of Liberal dithering and delaying? A, a government under Premier Ford that is getting things done. <laughs> Two new medical schools in the province of Ontario. Order. Granton and your Order. Every single medical school in the province of Ontario has more residency positions, more medical seats in, available. The, Member the for Don Valley East, come to order. Surgeon, actually assessing, reviewing, and ultimately licensing internationally trained and educated physicians who want to live and work in the province of Ontario. And, of course. Stop the clock. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. Please start the clock. The Minister of Health has the floor. I apologize for And of course, this morning's exciting announcement, Dr. Jane Philpott, who will be leading and encouraging and Response. expanding on a program that we started in January of 2023 called Your Health Plan. We have been able. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister for Red Tape Reduction will come to order. The supplementary question. Back to the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has accomplished nothing over the last six years except drive our health care system into the ground. Now, Mr. Speaker, last Thursday at the Empire Club, I watched the Premier gush over the United States and China without mentioning health care once. But in his own writing, 32,000 people don't have a family doctor, which is 10,000 more people than just two years ago. In the Minister of Health's writing, 17,000 people don't have a family doctor. And yes, that is the same health minister who suggested that the recruitment and retention of doctors in Ontario is not a major concern. And maybe that's why health care is a catastrophe. As we speak, every hospital in Toronto is in surge, meaning they're stretched beyond their limits and flu season hasn't even started. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier expect Ontarians to get through this winter, let alone the next five winters, when two and a half million people don't have a family doctor and every single one of our hospitals is understaffed, underfunded and over capacity? To respond, the Minister of Health. 90 per cent. Leading Canada, 90 per cent of Ontario residents have access and are connected to a primary care practitioner. We're not stopping there. That's why we are doing the expansions in our medical schools. That's why we are doing the expansion in our residency positions. We are doing the work to make sure, in the short, the medium, and the long term, 
we will have capacity in the province of Ontario. You know, Speaker, I often think if only, if only the Liberals and the NDP, when they were in power, had actually started to plan for an expanding and aging population, we wouldn't be here. But we are, and we're getting it done. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Immigration and the Skills Development and Training. He's right there. The skilled trades workers are the backbone of Ontario's economy, whether it is electricians, plumbers, carpenters, machinists, and so many more. They are all helping to meet the growing infrastructure needs of our province. Yet, with the looming retirement of generation of skilled tradespeople, it is more urgent than ever that we address this gap. Given the critical role of skilled trade to our economy, we must act now to provide the right training, incentives, and support to build up the workforce for today Question. and for tomorrow. Speaker, can the minister please outline what actions our government is taking to address the skills shortage in the trade and ensure that we have enough skilled workers? Thank you. Mr. Labour, Immigration Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate uh, the question from the member opposite and thank him for his advocacy for young uh, men and women in the skilled trades. Under the Premier, uh, Speaker, we have an ambitious plan to build Ontario. $200 billion investment into infrastructure, but we know that one in three tradespeople are retiring. Speaker, we stand on the shoulders of a golden generation of men and women in the trades who've built this province. And it's up to us to inspire more young boys and girls to enter the trades. That's why I'm proud that in Working for Workers 5, we created more learning opportunities into the skilled trades by expanding OEAP speaker. The Focus Apprenticeship in the Skilled Trades Are Fast program is allowing young students in grade 11 or 12 to get hours that will count towards their level one speaker. It's no different than Response. those who take a dual credit program. We're also expanding the level up a skilled trades career fair to over 35,000 students to open an inspiring a new career into the trades and help expand their Thank you very much. The supplementary question, back to the member for Scarborough and Agent Board. The speaker, Ontario's businesses are telling us that they are struggling to fill vacancies. These vacancies are causing delays to projects that are critical to our province's economic recovery and growth. This is impacting everything from building new homes and schools to larger scale infrastructure projects. What more, despite the demand, many young Ontarians and women still do not see skilled trades as a viable or attractive career path. Incorrect stereotypes continue that the trades are somehow a, quote, second choice compared to university education or only for men. The skilled trades Question. are high paying jobs in demand that are providing stable employment and pathway to middle class successes. Speaker, can the minister share what steps our government is taking to promote skilled trades as a career choice for young Ontarians and women? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. You know, as I was uh, just sitting down listening to that question, my seatmate reminded me that his uh, young uh, son, uh, who I believe was a page in this was, place, yeah. is enrolled at Canador in aircraft mechanics. So it's exciting to see. But, Speaker, it's not just about students. It's about breaking down barriers for women. You know, some of the common sense changes that aren't that common these days, Speaker, we've done 
is bring the same expectations on bathroom facilities from Bay Street to Main Street, empowering more women uh, on, the job on the job site. Not only that, Speaker, we're keeping women safe. We've expanded uh, regulations to ensure properly fitting protected equipment, or PPE, and I hope all members of this place uh, vote in support of our latest Working for Workers bills to ensure women are safe on the job site, getting rid of the days of shrink it and pink it, and ensuring that we have properly fitting PPE for women. Uh, speaker, an economy that doesn't work Response. for women doesn't work at all, and I'm proud to yeah. see more women enter the trades under the leadership of this Premier. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. We are eight weeks into the school year, and families in Renfrew County still do not have school buses. The buses haven't been running because this government broke the funding formula and expected school boards and operators to run student transportation at a loss. But instead of fixing the nightmare they had caused, the government just sat on its hands for weeks on end while families made financial sacrifices to get their kids to school. And now they forced the Renfrew school boards to cut classroom resources in order to reach a deal. If this was Toronto, the government would never have allowed this to happen. How could the Premier and the Minister of Education fail Renfrew families so badly? Yeah. And to reply, the Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's my honour to stand as the, the new Minister of Education. Our, our government's priority to boards is to provide stability and predictability, which is why every single board receive an increase to their student transportation budget for this school year. The member opposites like to mention our funding formula, and I think it's important that, uh, and all members, know that as a result of the funding formula, school boards actually saw an $80 million increase in funding for school transportation this year. That brings our total investment for transportation in Ontario to $1.3 billion for the current school year. And what does that mean on the ground? That means that every single board in Ontario received a minimum 3% increase. And the, the member knows in her own area, we've seen double-digit increases, and that includes Renfrew County as well. I can assure you, as a minister and as a mother as well, my duty is to ensure that students are getting to school. Thank you. A supplementary question. It's ironic that the new new minister mentioned predictability and stability, Speaker, because it's not just Renfrew County. Families across the province are dealing with chaos in student transportation. Longer walks to school in unsafe conditions long-term route cancellations, school buses just not showing up in the morning. Meanwhile, school boards are being forced to take resources out of the classroom just to provide this inadequate level of student transportation. This government is failing Ontario families with a funding formula that is another government scheme that is literally leaving our kids behind. Will the Minister of Education fix the student transportation funding formula so that every child in Ontario can get to school safely every day. Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the funding formula, we went through extensive consultations to arrive at that funding formula, which has in fact allowed the increase to be $80 million across the school transportation fund. And as I said, that is a minimum 3% increase for all school boards across the, the province, with some have an increase, a double-digit increase. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the member that we are providing stability and predictability to our school boards, and that's why, with the change in the funding formula, we were able to increase the funding for school board tra transportation, as well as increasing the funding across the board for all school boards in this province. Mr. Speaker, we will provide stability uh, to the, the school boards and ensure that transportation is available to all students. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning and welcome back. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. People across the province cannot find an affordable place to call home. The situation is dire. Young people leaving Ontario because they can't afford to buy a home. Full-time workers not able to pay the rent in the communities they work in. An unprecedented number of people experiencing homelessness in Ontario. Speaker. The Premier has to stop distracting from the housing crisis and saying no to affordable homes. Fourplexes, mid-rises, nonprofit co-op and social housing. 
So today, I will give the Premier an opportunity to reverse course to fix this problem. Speaker, will the Premier stop saying no and say yes to quickly building homes that people can afford in the communities they love by legalizing more types of homes across the province to bring down costs for housing? To reply, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the question goes right back to the member from the Green Party. Are you going to stop saying no to every single housing plan we have and start saying yes? Because you've voted against every housing project, Order. every single provincial Order. act we've put forward. It's no, no, no. It's no from the NDP. It's no from the Liberals. It's no from the Green Party. You can't Order. sit your butt on two sides of the fence. You end up getting slivers you know where. And you've got more slivers you know where than you could shake a stick at. Mr. Speaker, we've created the opportunities for people to go out there and put a down payment on by creating 860,000 jobs. We created more manufacturing jobs last year than all 50 U.S. states combined. Response. This year alone, we've seen 165,000 people employed. There's over, there's over 137 companies that invested here, creating 12,200 jobs. That's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a seat. The supplementary question. Back to the member for Guelph. Speaker, let's be clear. What the government is doing on housing is not working. Why would I say yes to a plan that doesn't build homes that people can afford? Year-to-date housing starts are down in Ontario. Most housing experts say it will be impossible for the government to reach their goal of 1.5 million homes. And let's be clear, people who oftentimes don't agree housing activists, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, OREA, home builders and academics all agree on one thing. The fastest and cheapest way to build homes people can afford is to say yes to fourplexes, gentle density and mid-rise housing. People in rural communities and in big cities all say the province holds the key to unlocking affordable homes. Question. So, speaker, I'm going to give the Premier one more time. Will the Premier say no to wealthy speculators and say yes to legalizing multiplexes and mid-rises so we can get to work on building homes people can afford in the communities that they love? And to reply, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, we led the lead to remove the HST on purpose-built rentals. Yeah, yeah. You vote against that. We eliminated municipal fees on affordable and non-profit housing. You voted against that. We introduced over $3 billion in new funding for municipalities to help funding housing enabling infrastructure. You're against that. You're against the, the $1.2 billion in funding for those who meet or exceed the housing targets. You vote against it. Order. All the NDP, all the Green and the Liberals, it's no. Let's not build homes. Let's not build transit. Let's not create new jobs. Let's go back the way Order. you were for 15 years have you bankrupt this province. <coughs> We're creating that environment. We are the envy of the Spons. world. We are an economic powerhouse because of our policies. Stop the clock. Before I start the clock again, I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. I'll ask the member for Ottawa South to come to order. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, since you announced that you won't be running again in the next election, I want to thank you for all of your service over the last 34 years. You've been an exemplar for all of us. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Mines. Ontario is home to vast deposits of critical minerals, particularly in the Ring of Fire. These minerals are important for the building of batteries, electric vehicles, and other clean technologies. The minerals are key to driving our domestic industries, but also to help make Ontario a global leader in clean energy transition. However, 
To fully realize this potential, we need a robust and sustainable supply chain that helps industry and local communities. Speaker, could the minister please provide an update on our government's efforts to strengthen Ontario's mineral supply chain? Here, here. Thank you very much. To reply, the Minister of Mines. Speaker, thank you very much for this question. Uh, there's two important legs to this strategy, critical mineral strategy. One is the Ontario Junior Minerals Exploration Program. We've had phenomenal drill uh, uh, progress and success all across Northern Ontario. The latest is cesium that we've just discovered north of Timmins. It's a strategic metal that's required for, for, uh, for national security. And of course, we've got the Critical Minerals Innovation Fund. The first round of funding for this strategy, with, for this strategy was, was, over, was oversubscribed. To that end, in the, the budget of 2024, we announced an additional $15 million over three years to expand the Critical Minerals Innovation Fund. We're really excited to announce the winners of this fund so that they can continue to do the great work they are doing developing Made in Ontario solutions. Right on. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario, Ontario is well placed to become a global leader in the supply of critical minerals. Cesium, I hadn't heard of that one before. That's, that's, that's a new one. These minerals, like cesium, nickel, lithium, and cobalt, are all important for advanced manufacturing and the clean energy economy. The demand for these minerals is projected to skyrocket as countries around the world transition to electric vehicles and renewable energy. Speaker, in 2023 alone, the value of critical minerals produced in Ontario was $6.4 billion. Could the minister please highlight some of the success stories that the CMIF program has produced to date and how they are helping position Ontario as a leader in the critical mineral development. Good. Minister of Mines. Again, uh, speaking for the question. Since 2022, the CMIF fund has invested 12 industry-led, including Indigenous-owned critical minerals innovation projects. The first project I would like to highlight is a collaboration between Valley Can Canada and Morocco. Morocco, or the Mining Innovation Rehabilitation and Applied Research Corporation, is a leader in providing innovation solutions to the, for the mining industry. They are currently developing techniques to reprose mining, mining by byproducts to extract nickel and cobalt from mine waste and tailings to use in the battery supply chain. The second project is Carbonex, an indigenous-owned company that is helping to refine processing for converting mining waste and other byproducts into high-energy density graphite, also used in the battery supply chain. Our ministry will continue Response. to pursue and support innovations in the mining sector that will continue to drive economic opportunities and secure Ontario's critical mineral supply Very chain. Good. Very good. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, a London West family told me that their father recently suffered a heart attack, a stroke, and a hip fracture. He was approved for two PSW visits and four hours of home care per day, uh, plus respite. In the months since, he has never received that level of care on a single day. His family has been forced to step in to attend to his daily needs, and they take turns sleeping beside him at night. They haven't had a single hour of respite. Speaker, why is this Premier forcing family members to become home care providers instead of fixing the broken home care system? And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. There's no doubt that the home care and community care needed to have some additional investments, which was why I was so pleased that the Minister of Finance and our government has actually increased home care and community care investments by over a billion dollars. We absolutely understand that when individuals leave hospital and they continue their treatment pathway in their home communities, in their homes, that we need to make sure that the uh, PSWs, the, the, the critical infrastructure is there. And that's why we're making investments, whether it is increasing the wages for, for personal support workers, whether it's expanding the number of opportunities that individuals can learn and become personal support workers, and of course, ensuring that we have that critical Response. health human resources when people need it in their homes. Thank you. 
supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Not only is home care failing families every single day, the supply needed to provide home care are not available. Ask any physician in this home. They know that under this government scheme, home care patients are being forced to shop and pay for the supplies that they need to stay alive, to stay out of the hospital. Supply that this government decided to contract out to Bayshore. Speaker, why are large corporations who put profit ahead of quality care continually given preferential treatment by this Conservative government? I'd like to ask the Minister, is this another profit over patient care scandal? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. What this is is a government that has been committed since day one to ensure that home and community care have the investments and the resources they need to do the job. It is so important. You know, for a decade, the NDP propped up the Liberals as they created the, the longest health care wait times in Ontario's history. I'm going to quote from the Ontario Community Support Association CEO. Home and community care plays a critical role in the future of a strong Ontario health system. Legislative changes that strengthen this vital service will be important for supporting client care in an integrated health care system. We're bringing these pieces together to make sure that our loved ones, whether they are in hospital, in a long-term care home, in their own home, in Bonds. their community, get the support they need when they need it. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Small Business. This week marks Ontario Small Business Week, a time to celebrate and recognize the vital role that small businesses serve in driving economic growth innovation and job creation across this province and country. Our communities are stronger because of the economic output of small businesses. When they grow and prosper, so does our province. However, many small business owners continue to face significant challenges. These challenges include high inflation, supply chain disruption, increased operation costs, and the harmful Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. Speaker. Could the Associate Minister please highlight what our government is doing to support small businesses and why it's essential to recognize and invest in the entrepreneurs who are key to Ontario's economic success? And to reply, the Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Thornhill for her advocacy for her constituents. Speaker, there are more than 400,000 small businesses across Ontario, accounting for about 98% of total Ontario businesses. They form the backbone of our economy, employing well over 2 million people right across our province. Wow. And the member from Thornhill is absolutely right. Small businesses are vital in keeping our economy competitive and thriving, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to celebrate them this week. While the previous Liberal government drove business and investment away from this province, this government has acted to create the environment for businesses to grow by lowering taxes, reducing electricity costs and cutting red tape, enabling an estimated $8 billion in cost savings and supports for Ontario employers every single year. Speaker, our government will continue Spons. to pat the backs of small businesses so that they can keep doing what they do best, you, creating Kelly. jobs and serving their communities. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response and her great leadership. While it's encouraging to hear about the strong leadership shown by our government, many small business owners, particularly in my riding of Thornhill, are still expressing concerns about the ongoing economic challenges. Many small business owners in Ontario have voiced concerns about ongoing negative burden that high taxes, excessive re uh, regulations, and the impact of the Trudeau carbon tax continues to have on their bottom line. Rising operation costs due to these factors continue to put additional strain on small businesses that are already struggling with inflation and supply chain issues. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on the different supports our government provides to small businesses to ensure that they can start, operate and expand their businesses? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the member for the question. 
Speaker, under the leadership of the Premier, our government remains dedicated to supporting small businesses on their journey to success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through initiatives like Starter Company Plus, Summer Company and Futurepreneur, we provide entrepreneurs with training, mentorship and grants to launch successful ventures. Our 47 small business enterprise centres and many, many business advisory services right across our province offer personalised guidance to help businesses navigate challenges and expand their presence, providing valuable tools and resources to entrepreneurs so their businesses can thrive in today's competitive marketplace. Our plan is working, Speaker, and we look forward to continuing to create the economic conditions for small businesses to succeed. I encourage all members and anyone watching Spots. to support small businesses and shop local. Happy Small Business Week. Well Next question, member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. As confirmed by CBC Marketplace, there is corruption in driver training and driver testing and there are only 28 people to staff inspection stations across all of Northern Ontario. The government has the power, the means, and the responsibility to reduce the number of horrific accidents taking place on our highways. The solutions are staring us in the face. So what on earth is stopping the government from ending the carnage? And to respond, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have no tolerance and zero tolerance for bad actors on our roads or those who are training these individuals, Mr. Speaker. The Ministry of Colleges and Training also has a robust uh, program on enforcing against uh, those colleges uh, and private institutions that are carrying this out. We even made significant investments uh, in both frontline officers as well as facilities across the province, including one. Uh, just uh, outside that member's riding in Shunya, where we invested $30 million state-of-the-art uh, project to ensure that we keep uh, people uh, safe. And we will continue to work with our uh, partners at the OPP uh, and others across the industry to continue having the safest roads uh, in, uh, in, the, in the world, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have brought countless a number of measures uh, to this House with those members that voted against uh, to increase penalties on bad drivers, and we will continue to make sure our roads are safe. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to